Good morning, everybody. Hello. As everybody's coming in this morning, let's go over a few announcements. Actually, I think it's a lot of announcements today. Um, it seems like everything just keeps coming, coming, and coming. Uh, if you look real quick, we are still doing the way through the life. We're still getting books together. There is still room to order them. Um, we do have a few extras, but there's also, we can get them ordered. See Sue Milhone, please. They're $7 a book. If you're interested in being in the choir, Christmas will soon be here. Yes, I'm sorry to say that, but it will be. Uh, we'll be having a brief meeting this morning following fellowship. We were supposed to do it last week, we forgot about it. <laughs> so yes, after worship, if you're interested in being in choir. Um, I am needed for live activity. There's a list on here. If you have any other questions, please see Elisa Levitz for that. That will be coming up. Dinner with friends. This is the most exciting thing I have going on right here, people, because I love to eat. Dinner with friends is back. Everyone is invited this Wednesday, September 8th at 6 p.m. Dinner with Friends will be the second and the fourth Wednesday of every month. So that's bring a dish, come in, have fun, spend some time, conversation. Um, also coming up, Dave wanted me to make sure you knew that the Beaver Township EMF Fire and EMS Chicken Barbecue, this is the last day to get tickets, right? It's next Saturday, so you have time still, but if you want tickets, see Dave Blevins. It's the man running sound in the back. Um, Sunfest is coming up. If you're still interested in that, please get me your name and stuff so I can get tickets on order and get all that taken care of. Uh, Men's Rally in the Valley is coming up. Children's Benefit Dinner is coming up in October. Fall Retreat's coming up. Fall Bender Craft Show is coming up. We have a whole bunch of stuff coming up. And also coming up is Operation Christmas Child. And if anybody has questions about that, please see Scott Kleiner for that. Also, following, or at the end of service today, we will be doing offering for those of you on Facebook. Communion. Communion, I'm sorry. <laughs> Damn, that time offering that. too. Offering too, don't forget that. <laughs> but we will be doing communion tonight, or today. Uh, please get your stuff ready. Um, we'll be doing it, and then we can all stay get together. So let's go ahead and open up in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this beautiful time together, Lord, and fellowship and friendship. I pray that you just continue to bless the community, uh, bless the movement that we have going on, Lord, that you can just move throughout. And we're sharing ourselves, we're sharing you, we're sharing the church, dear Heavenly Father. I pray that you'll just move through the service today and just... Uh, allow us to be open and receptive to you. In your name I pray. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. It's a beautiful day out here. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. It's a beautiful day in the Lord. Every day is a beautiful day when the Lord's involved in it. Would you please stand as we read God's word this morning? We're reading from James chapter 5, verse 13. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Well, I've been in trouble at times, troubling things, and prayer has always been the answer for me. I hope it is for you. And I'm also a happy person. God has been so good to me, you know. I've been through some things these past couple years. I can't believe I'm saying that, but two, almost two years now. And the Lord has just been with me. I just feel his favor in this, and I'm just so grateful. And so I want to sing songs of praise this Amen. morning, and I hope you do too. So let's join and worship the Lord. Amen. It's a glorious day when Jesus took our sins away. Amen. 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 Let's sing glorious day. Thank you. 
share what the Lord has been doing in your life. Glory to God.
like shouting this morning. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. He is here in this place this yes. morning. Yes. Amen. Yes, it's such a blessing that we can just shout out to our Amen. Lord and praise Amen. Him. Like whatever. <laughs> it's you know, whatever we want. And and it's it's just wonderful that there's something every day that we can praise our Father for. There's way more than one thing every day that we can praise our Father for. But sometimes we have those hard days, and it might be hard to see. But if you can just focus on at least one thing to praise our Father for, that can just turn it all around and totally brighten your day. Sometimes we just need to block out the rest of the world and fix our eyes on Jesus. And we need our Father so much every day, every hour, every minute, every second. We need Him. And so as we go into this next song of worship, just focus on that never-ending provision that our Father gives to us. And He gives to us freely. We don't have to earn it. We just have to take it. And we just have to accept it. And it's just such a beautiful gift. He gives us everything we need. So continue praising our Father as we say, Lord, I need you.
words of that song this morning, I'm reminded how true those words are that Christ is all we need. We know there are many needs. Live this home, Dolores is home, praise the Lord for that, doing better. Jim's home, doing better, but just continue to lift them this morning. I want to lift the Rosbach family and remind you that at 3 o'clock today we're going to have a time of uh, visitation for Ruth and the family and then have a memorial service at 3.30 for God. And as I'm often inundated with the needs that surround us, with the needs of people's lives. I'm aware how often that people are seeking out others to give them hope, to give them consolation, to give them the help they need, to give them the ability to, to get through the weather of the storm of life. And it is a blessing of God to have the people in our lives that He has put in our lives. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the only one who can raise us up with His mighty, righteous right hand is the Lord our God. And it is that grace, it is that strength, it is, it is to live as Christ, to die as King, it is that strength that is the only source we offer to others. And reminded us, Peter and John entered the temple after Christ's resurrection, and there was a man there, a beggar, lame, couldn't walk, begging for bread, begging for anything. And as Peter looked at him, and a man looked, he expected to get something. Peter's words in my ears this morning. Silver and gold I have none. But what I have who I am whose I am I offer to you in the name of Christ. Get up. Sons and daughters we are children of the God who raised Christ to life. The spirit that rose him from that grave, the spirit that shook the earth and rolled away the stone, is the spirit that lives within us. For your life, for your family, for your relationships, for your needs, he hasn't given us silver and gold always, but he gives us all that we need in Christ. And I hope your prayer this morning, I hope that your life reflects to everyone you meet that you freely offer what Christ has poured into your life. So we go to prayer this morning. Let's lift up all the needs, but let's lift up a voice of praise this morning to our Heavenly Father for His gracious gift of love through His Son, Jesus Christ. Let's lift up those who are hurting, those who are in need, but let us lift up our voices in praise. Would you join with me, Father? We come to you this morning with hearts that are overwhelmed by the needs of the world all around us. Overwhelmed sometimes by our own needs, by sickness, by disease, by chaos and disunity and distress. And yet in the middle of storms and hurricanes and earthquakes and wars and rumors of wars, we're reminded that all we need all that we've ever needed, all that we will ever need has been found in Jesus Christ and the grace He so freely gives. This morning, may our hearts overflow, not with worry, not with fear, not with dread. May our hearts overflow with praise. May our hearts overflow with joy. May our hearts overflow with peace and adoration for you. May you heal the brokenness of our world, the brokenness of our own lives, the brokenness in our families and relationships, the brokenness in our country, the brokenness in our leaders, the brokenness in our homes, Lord. May you heal it by the grace that you freely give. The shame has said so wonderfully, it's not to be earned, it's not to be deserved, it is something that is to be received. May we fully receive, may we fully receive all the grace that you so freely offer us this morning. As the song says, you really are all we need. All. No comma, no asterisks, no, no but what ifs, no but you don't understand, no, but you 
are all we need. May we take hold of that, begin to live the best life here and now that leads to the best life that's yet to come. We love you this day. We give you the praise, all the glory, and all the love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's sing that chorus again. this year? I watched all of about 48 seconds, I think, of the Olympics this year. And I don't know why, I just couldn't get into the mood for it. But the thing about the Olympics that amazes me is the preparation. The preparation. Not just from the gymnast. You think about preparation for an Olympics. I mean, there are decades sometimes that go into preparation. When a city hosts the Olympics, they don't just get picked four years out for the next Olympic, they're working for decades to get the, the facilities ready and the area ready and the places ready. They build things, you know, Lake Placid, New York, you know, it's, it's a great example. And I've never been to Lake Placid, but I mean, you know, that city worked hard to get the bid for the Winter Olympic. I couldn't even tell you what year it was, but they didn't just wake up one morning and say, you know what would be cool is if we had the Olympics here, and then the next few years they had it. It was decades. And there are things still in Lake Placid, New York, that were built for one reason and one reason only, for the Olympics. And a lot of those things, the Olympics comes, the Olympics goes, and that stuff just goes away. And it's a sort of an amazing thing that how much time we can put into the preparation of something that is here today and is gone tomorrow. 
What are some other things in life that you spend time prepping for? How many of you, I mean, this is September, so all the kids are where? In school. Now, some of you parents spend a lot of time preparing for your child's first day of school. You're like Shelly and I, who are at Walmart the night before at 10 o'clock, looking through all the leftovers. I can't find this. I can't. Where do I get this guy? How do I get that? And then you eventually say to your kid, it's good enough. Just go to school. <laughs> Not exactly, but come on. You, you know what I'm talking about. We've been there. We've done that. Some other things you spend, maybe a new job, right? <clears throat> You get a new job, you start prepping, you get your mind ready, you get your body ready, you find out, you know, how should I dress, is there specific gear I need, are there specific things I need to know, you know, there's a lot of stress, a lot of work. Some other big things that you spend time prepping for, a wedding, a wedding, you know, I get to be a part of a lot of weddings, a lot of weddings, and I'm always amazed at how much time people can spend preparing for a wedding. You know, it's not even a whole day, folks. I mean, when you get right down to it, the ceremony, and I tell folks, you know, weddings and funerals, 30 minutes and out. It's like, the like site dominoes, 30 minutes or it's free, right? Because you don't want, you know, you might be really excited about this big day, but all the people you invited, they're just thinking about what's for lunch, right? Let's be honest. They're only coming for the reception, that's really, they like you, but they don't love you that much. So, you spend a lot of time and the money, and I heard some people say, for a baby, right? How much time do you spend getting prepared for a baby? I mean, there's baby showers. I'm like, you know, I can't wait for the kids to get old enough to wash themselves. Or every time I turn around, there's a baby getting a shower. I don't get it. And there's all these gifts and stuff to buy and rooms, and you gotta have a nursery, and you gotta have the baby monitor, you gotta, you gotta have this, this, this. And I mean, all the time, especially that first child, people put so much time, so much energy, and, you know, and they're so protective of that first child. And I'm telling you, when that second one comes along, you're like, you know, here comes the garbage man. You're like, oh, dude, hold this kid. I gotta go do something over here. And you're like, I mean, it's amazing. All that time, and let's, let's, let's be honest, no matter how much time you spent preparing for your children to come, you were not ready. And God's kind of got a sense of humor, because no matter how prepared you were after the first one, the second one comes along, God changes everything. And they're not alike. I told Shelly, you know, we had a big 12-year gap between our kids, and I told Shelly repeatedly, we are not going to mess our second child up like we did the first one, all right? We've learned a lot, we've experienced a lot, we've had this 12 years. we're not going to mess him up like the first one. We're still going to do it, but we're going to do it totally different. So preparation is good, but what's more important than preparation is what you're preparing for. Even our relationship with Jesus requires preparation. We're in Luke 22, verses 1 through 6. Now the festival of unleavened bread called the Passover was approaching, and the chief priests and teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus, for they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, one of the twelve, and Judas went to the chief priests and officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. They were delighted and agreed to give him money. He consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. G Judas was preparing. Right? Judas was preparing, but what was he preparing for? He was preparing to betray Jesus. You know, I have a little theory on that, and I'm not even sure that Judas really thought he was betraying Jesus to death. You know, Judas watched Jesus walk out of the middle of a crowd of people who wanted to make him king and couldn't lay a hand on him. Judas watched Jesus walk away from the Pharisees when they sought to seize him and throw him off a cliff. Judas had seen Jesus untouchable. I don't really think Judas was preparing to betray Jesus to death. I think Judas was preparing for something else, something that he'd worked on for a long time. Judas was preparing to get rich. He thought he could betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver because he didn't think they could touch him. Now, he loved Jesus and Jesus was his friend, but he might have loved money just a little bit more. You remember, Judas was the purse holder. Judas, he was the Steve Duckworth of the disciples. 
Oh, let me get that. Let me, let me clarify a little bit. He was responsible for paying the bills and counting the money. Okay, so, so listen. But Judas, Judas was the guy that had to look at the dollars and the cents flowing through there. You now Judas didn't just happen overnight. Judas had been with Jesus for three years. But along the way, Judas was preparing because he was feeding something along the way. He was feeding his desire for wealth. He was feeding his greed. He was feeding his envy. Because he looked at these, these leaders, these scribes, these teachers of the law with their self-righteousness. And, and he didn't buy into the self-righteousness, but he did like the kind of clothes they wore. He did like the kind of places they had meals. He did like the kind of lifestyle they lived because he thought, man... It'd be kind of nice to live lifestyles of the rich and famous. And so Jesus, Judas was preparing for three years to betray Jesus, not because he hated Jesus, but because he loved wealth. And his preparation day after day, moment by moment, compromise by compromise, was preparing him for the day that he would go to these who wanted to harm Jesus and that he would strike a deal. He prepared for that moment for a long time. Even before Jesus, Judas had been preparing in here for what would eventually lead him to the place where his hands took part in a function, in a tangible event that he could have never imagined himself doing. But you see, sometimes we're preparing for things and we're not even aware that we're preparing for it. But the life we live and the things we do, they're preparing us all right. They're preparing us one way or another. And in James chapter 1, 13 through 15, it says this, When tempted, no one should say, God has tempted me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to to death. You see, we're all in preparation. There's no doubt about that. The question is, what are we preparing for? If you want to know what you're preparing for, then you can begin to look at your life, begin to look at your thought life, begin to look at your habits, the things you spend time dwelling on, the nature of which you spend your money, and the nature of which you spend your time. You will begin to see that those things our preparation for what's yet to come. And it's not a question of whether or not you're preparing because how many of you spend money? Not rhetorical, do you spend money? Okay, good. How many of you spend money on what you need? How many of you spend money on what you want? You do. I mean, you don't think you do, but you really do. I've experienced this you know, all of my life, you know, I, I worked for a gentleman who told me how tight money was. I mean, it wasn't because he was paying me so much, trust me. But he would tell me he was broke. I mean, all the time he would tell me he was broke. And we couldn't spend money on this, we couldn't spend money on this. You know, he'd want me to fix something and then he'd get after me, I'm spending too much money on cars and do this. But when it came time for a new Ford pickup truck, four wheel drive, he went out. He found it and he did this. It's an amazing thing. There's this little book and there's this little piece of paper. And did you know that you can write your name on this little piece of paper and you can put all these numbers with lots of zeros for a new truck on those papers, tear it out and give it to the man and they give you stuff. It's amazing. <laughs> only, you know, I've only learned just a few weeks ago, Shelly told me, honey, you have to have money in there. <laughs> Yeah, I got that big check thing in the, I thought I was rich. No. But he, he would tell me how poor he was, but then he could write a check literally for whatever he wanted. And so you see, we don't, we're preparing because we think that we're, we're being frugal. We think we don't have this, we don't have that. But the reality is, whatever we're preparing our heart for, we find the money and the time. And I've met that with teenagers so many times, being a youth leader and a youth pastor. And I have parents tell me, that they don't have money to send their kids to this camp or that camp or Bible quiz or this activity, that activity. They just don't have money for it. And the next thing I know, I find out there's a $450 sport camp, band camp, this camp, that camp. And they've signed their kids up, paid, signed, delivered. Because guess what? The school doesn't wait on their money. The school doesn't take payments. 
they say you, you put the money or you don't go. And somehow, magically, that money appears. And I'm not criticizing, I'm just saying, even in my own life, the money is there. We spend what we value. We spend time, thought, and resources towards what we value. And what we value, folks, is an indication of what we're preparing for in life. In Luke in chapter 22, verses 7 through 14, then came the day of unleavened bread, of which the Passover lamb had to be crucified. Jesus sent Peter and John, and he said, Go make preparations. Go make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it? They asked. He replied, If you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters, and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared for the Passover. And when the hour came, Jesus' and apostles were lying at the table. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Now, I want you to do just a slight history lesson. The Passover. Now, when we celebrate the Passover here, the elements are on the table. We do communion. Communion, for us as Christians, represents Passover to the Jewish people. And as Jesus and his disciples sat down, the preparation to eat in this upper room was all about God's command to be prepared for the Passover. How many of you remember the story of the Passover? Some of you do, some of you don't. It's the story of Moses. Most of you remember Moses. And we're getting to an age, just an ADD moment here, folks. A lot of kids, a lot of the generation coming up, they don't know Moses. They don't know Joseph. They don't know the coat of many colors. They don't know David and Goliath. They don't know a lot of those things because, folks, we haven't prepared them to step into the faith that we desire for them. Now, I'm not saying this, I'm saying this collectively. We as the people of God are losing generations, even to the most basic truths of God's word. But the preparation for the, for the Passover is a big thing. The people were enslaved for 400 years. Moses came, he killed an Egyptian, he buried him in the sand, he ran out to the desert for another 40 years, and God showed up in a flaming bush and said, Moses, set my people free. And Moses said, but God, I can't talk, I can't do this, I can't do that. Sent my brother Aaron, and God was ticked off, but he finally conceded, and he sent Aaron, and Aaron went with Moses, he went to Pharaoh, and it was time for Aaron to speak, and Moses suddenly got bold, and he said, let my people go! And Pharaoh said, dude, all right, they're out of here. No. There was a series of, he said, yes, and then he recanted, yes, play, yes, no, play, yes, no, play, yes, no, play, all the way until the last plague, which was the plague of the firstborn. And so God spoke to Moses and he said, tell the people to get ready. It is in Exodus chapter 12, if you want to read it, I'm not going to go through all of it right now, so I'll give you the Jan Little version. Go and get a lamb. And at night, on the 14th day, even the lamb, you know, it wasn't just tomorrow. They had to, and Moses, um, God told Moses and Aaron, he said, this month, the month of Passover, which somewhere was in the spring, we don't know exact dates, but somewhere around April. And he said, this is going to be the first. He said, this is a new beginning. So this is the first month of the year. So on the first day, pick out a lamb, and the 14th day later, days later, take the lamb, and at twilight just at evening, kill the lamb, and don't just kill the lamb, kill the lamb that is big enough to feed you and your family, and if you're just one or two people, you don't have enough, then go to your neighbor, there's not to be anything left over, don't boil it, don't uh, don't cook it in a stew, you said you gotta roast it over fire, leave the entrails and the head on it, roast it over fire and eat it, don't leave anything left, come morning, make sure you burn everything that's left, and when you slaughter the lamb, take some of the blood, and take it on the sides of the pillars of the doorpost, and over the frame of the doorpost, and at midnight, my spirit is gonna come, and the spirit the angel of death is going to come and he's going to come through and take the firstborn of every animal and every child born in Egypt. And when he sees the blood of the lamb on the post and on the sides, he'll know that that is my sign that I am looking over you, that I am protecting you, that I have delivered you, and he will not touch your home. And in the morning comes and I want you to pack up and be ready in the middle of the night and as soon as the sun shines, get your van loaded, get the minivan loaded, get the SUV loaded, get the cart loaded, get the donkey loaded, and get out of town. And before you get out of town, go to your neighbors and ask them for gold and jewelry and everything they can have. And in this way, God plundered all the Egyptians and he took silver and gold and he sent his people and they left the city. That took a lot of preparation. It wasn't just a whim. It felt like it because it was kill the lamb, 
eat the meat, pack up, and leave that first light. But all of this was a preparation. So when Jesus said to Peter and John, go and prepare for the Passover, I want you to look at that a little differently. Because we read that today and we think, oh, call, call the banquet center and get a room and you know, get the caterers locked up and get them to come. Make sure somebody gets the, you know, the grape juice and the bread. Make sure that's, that's preparation for the Passover. Folks, this is symbolic of what preparation for God's deliverance is. This isn't the deliverance. It's the reminder of how God has delivered us. It's the preparation. It requires a lot of planning, a lot of preparation. It was the parallel of the Passover, but with a different lamb. You see, the preparation that he wanted to make was for the lamb, as Revelation 13 says, the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. And the blood of that lamb wouldn't be on the doorpost, wouldn't be on the side chains. The blood of that lamb would be sprinkled on our hearts. Psalm 51, David said, Lord, sprinkle me. Sprinkle me with this. Sprinkle me. Cover my sins. Blot out my sins. That though red as scarlet through your blood are cleaned and washed and purified white as snow. <laughs> our life, our relationship is preparing us but what is it preparing us for today? Take a look at your current culture all around you. Folks, as the old cartoon character Poe said, most of you have no idea who that is. Look it up. Poe said, we have seen the enemy and he is us. We're our own worst enemy. Because you see, the culture around you, you can blame politicians, policies, politics. You can blame social media. You can blame popular media, music, movies, TV. You can blame anything you want. But the reality of the current state of affairs in our culture is because there is a ruler on the throne who is more powerful than any other thing Amen. in our lives. Amen. And if you want to know what that ruler looks like, you want to know where they live, you want to know what they do, look in the mirror. Because you see, self is the ruler of this age. Self is the one who's making the decisions. Self is the one who is preparing us and the generations following us for the future that we will inherit. See, the challenge with our world today, it isn't popular media and culture and politics because all those people are guided by the same ruler, self. And we'd like to think that, that the church and the body of Christ is exempt from that, folks, but it is not. Self is just as powerful in the seats of a church on a Sunday morning as it is in the citadels of power in Washington, D.C. or anywhere in the world. And when self is in control, chaos always follows. Not just in culture. You want to know what happens in our homes? So, the interesting thing to me, um, I've been asked uh, next Saturday, September 11th, to do a, um, a little teaching thing on a day, a day thing, and it's for, it's a marriage retreat for young adults. Now, they asked me, obviously, Laura didn't talk to Shelly first, and didn't ask her if I was qualified, or what my experience would be. But one of the books that I have read late, lately on, on marriage and how to make good marriage is called I Marriage by Andy Stanley. And the whole book is simply this. Either you're in charge or God is. And if you want to know what's wrong with your marriage is if you're in charge, 
your marriage is in trouble. If God's in charge, life is good. It's not easy. It's not perfect. But you'll survive. Amen? Amen. All of life is preparation. Self rules on the throne of humanity is never born. You know, there's a lot of conversation about the beast and that psalm talked about Jesus' return. And a lot of people are trying to figure out who the beast is and, and what the mark of the beast is and those things. I give you my little ADD summary of the beast and the mark of the beast. Is anybody here, you know, if we want to know what the mark of the beast is, how many of you here are vaccinated? Just kidding. <laughs> Lighten up, folks. Here's the deal. We live in a world that's trying to separate us from all these things and, and people that want, you know, he says on the hand and on the forehead, the mark is, right? What do you what do you use this general area of your body for? Thinking. Processing. Decisions. And when this comes to conclusion, what does this part of your body function? What's the function? It's the action. And I'm not a theologian, and I'm not an expert on end times, but I think more likely to me where I see the mark of the beast is where we spend our time thinking on and what we spend our time doing because of where our thoughts are. I think the mark of the beast is the thoughts of the mind and the actions of the hand, folks. Because you can't say you love God and then hate your brother. John, not my words, John says, you, my friend, are a liar because you can't love God and then hate your brother you can't praise God and then curse the ones who made in his image folks all these things are preparation preparation for what and he said to them I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer for I tell you I will not eat again until I find fulfillment in the kingdom of God has it been fulfilled yes Jesus died went to to hell, took over hell, took the keys from Satan, came back, rose again on the third day. The kingdom of God, folks, is here. Look at your neighbor and say, kingdom has come. Tell your neighbor, in case, they have, in case they've been sleeping. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you, for I tell you, will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Hello, has the kingdom come? Some of you still are not convinced. Of has God's kingdom come? Yes. Okay. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, give it for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to the man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves, which of them it might be who would do this. You know, a thought occurs to me. Why would they break out an argument about who is going to betray Jesus? Does that mean that maybe they all thought, maybe, is it me? Is it, is it, is it you? Is it me? They broke out an argument. I mean, if you know you're not going to betray Jesus, you're not going to spend time arguing about whether it's you or not, you are. So maybe the real challenge here was even though they were with Jesus for three years, somewhere deep in the recess of their spirits and their minds, they hadn't prepared to really follow him all the way. Oh, they promised to. They swore. Peter said, even if it means my death, Lord, I would never I would never okay. copy it with you. And it could be you, depending on how you prepared your heart. The kingdom has come. Jesus ushered in the kingdom of God through the sacrifice of his death and resurrection. You know, I find it kind of interesting. I feel like we've all prepared to go to the kingdom of heaven. That's what Christianity is about, right? That's why there's churches. That's why there's pastors. That's why there's altar calls. You got to come up and get right so when you die, you go to heaven. But Jesus wasn't looking for people to die for the kingdom. Jesus was looking for sons and daughters who would live the kingdom life here and now. 
as a foretaste, as a light, as a light on a hill. That Jesus said to Matthew, you don't put a light under a bushel basket. You open it up, let the light shine into the darkness. Have we prepared to die? Most of us, I think, sort of have contemplated that. If you're here today, if you're watching online, you're probably prepared to die. The question this morning is, are you prepared to live? Because that looks radically different. Because there's going to be a lot of preparation that goes on to live the life God's called you to. It's going to mean discipline here. It's going to mean no compromise here. It's going to mean listening twice as much as you speak. It's going to mean sacrifice. Sacrifice of self for the rule of the kingdom in our hearts and lives. So I'm going to encourage you this morning before we take our communion together, I'm going to pray over here in a moment. Take a moment and guess what I'm going to ask you to do? Prepare yourself. Make preparations for the kingdom of God. As we take of the fruit of the vine and of the bread, ask God to search your heart. Ask God to examine your preparations. Ask God to reveal to you any unclean thing in your life. Folks, sometimes I think, I'm, I'm not cut out to be a preacher. Because I think of a preacher as somebody who tells everybody else how to do it because they figured it out. But I can tell you without a hesitancy or an uncertainty, that lying in my bed this morning, my Lord searched my heart. And he didn't find it clean. He didn't find it without a stain. But in his grace, he said, give that to me. Let go of that. Let me, I've covered that with the cross. Let go. Prepare. Prepare a place to receive my grace, my love, my cleansing blood. That's what I've done this morning all the way home. So before I pray, before we receive these elements, I encourage you to close your eyes to bow your heads. Take a moment and ask your daddy, your heavenly daddy, to search out that life that you've been living. Maybe some of those secret parts that you've not showed anyone else. But your daddy knows. And you know he knows. Today will be a great time in your seat at these altars to give to him what it is that is preparing you for something other than his best for your life. Prepare this morning to live the best life now and the best life to come. Go ahead and pray.
before the foundations of the world with a land that would be slain a land that would for once and all cover the sins of your people your sons and your daughters to take prodigals to take strangers to take outcasts to draw them to the place called home you eagerly waited looking down the road for your sons and daughters to come home so you can throw your arms around us and kiss us on the cheek put a robe and a ring on our finger and remind us the land was slain we are to come and partake at this altar of the gift of life the gift of freedom from the power of sin the freedom to not sin, the freedom to live a life, not just life, but to live it abundantly. Live life that doesn't just start when we die and enter into your home in heaven, but the day that begins, we start to live is now, Lord, for now is when death was arrested, but that too, we were set free. We give thanks for the elements, the bread and the wine, Lord, that reminds us of a life, of a body broken and of blood shed into the earth that it helped to form. As we partake of these elements, may we be reminded to prepare our hearts, to lay down our lives, to take up the life of Christ lived out in us. Join us together in a bond of unity and love that is so strong that the selfish nature of this world cannot divide us. May we leave to sons and daughters and generations yet to come footprints, a trail marked with love and sacrifice, and dedication and surrender. May they see in our lives when we take these elements that it is more than bread and wine, that it is life, it is health, it is wholeness, it is purpose, it is redemption. Give thanks for what we're about to receive. Purge and cleanse our hearts. Make us recipients of your grace, not through our own worthiness, but make us worthy through your love and your blood this morning. In Jesus' name. Usher's John was a hand out these elements. They are cups. The first little layer is the bread, and the second foil is the juice. Come this morning. Take the elements and hold them until we receive them together. And all are welcome to partake of the elements here this morning.
broken for you. He encouraged us to take this morning and to eat the bread. And as you eat this this morning, prepare your heart for his grace, for his mercy, for your redemption. Take and eat in remembrance of our Lord. As he gave thanks for it, he reminded us that the blood of Christ would be spilled out, poured onto the ground. He encouraged us to take and drink in remembrance of our sins. Take and drink in remembrance of the forgiveness of your sins this morning. Take and drink in remembrance of our Lord. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks for this opportunity to prepare our hearts and our minds to fully receive the grace offered to us through the sacrifice of Christ. May we be faithful participants in this journey, faithful participants in this grace, not seeking to hoard it to ourselves, but seeking always to be vessels, to be conduits of this grace poured into us, poured through us, and into the lives of others that you would call our lives to. May we be faithful sons and daughters. May we seek not to only enter into your kingdom through our physical death, but may we live this day in the kingdom life that you have prepared for us for and prepared for us. Your kingdom has come. Now may your will be done in our lives so that the whole world might also prepare. Father, we're reminded that all the days of these lives were written in your book before one of them came to be, and in every one of those days, you have been preparing opportunities, grace, love, forgiveness for us. May we be faithful to prepare our own lives to reflect the glory that you have called us to. As Paul says in Ephesians 4 1, may we live lives worthy of that calling, live lives worthy of that sacrifice, live lives worthy of that grace, and may every day find us in thought, in word, in deed, preparing, preparing for the fullness of your kingdom to come through our physical death or to come as you return to this earth to call us home. We love you this day again. Make us sons and daughters who proudly bear your name. In Christ's beautiful name we pray. Amen.
go in the grace and the peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and be a John of your generation, preparing the way, made straight the paths, prepare the way of the Lord for his God. Amen. God bless you. Greet one another as you dismiss to go to life groups. Don't forget, call in hours of visitation, 3 o'clock to 3.30 with a memorial service, celebration of life service for Don Rothbard. I encourage you to come and to be here. There's a meal prepared that we can share together with the family at 4 o'clock afterwards. God bless you. You're dismissed to go to life groups. God bless you. Have a wonderful, blessed day.